It seems that the worst thing a woman can do to the man she claims to love is betray that love by cheating on him. Mark Hurley thought about that as he sat in the dark, alone. Just a few hours ago, he thought he had it all the great job with a good company that paid well. A nice house and a loving wife. He still had the first two, but the third was another matter. He thought about his life with Allison. His wife of nearly five years, he met her shortly after she joined the company where he works. The Marcus Financial Group, a company that helps small businesses with their finances, like so many others. She started in the administrative support section taking care of all the niggling clerical things that have to be done in their business dealings. From there, she became an executive assistant to Jake Marcus, his boss, about seven months ago. It's no coincidence that Jake's last name is Marcus. His grandfather started the company decades ago and handed it off to his son, Alan. The current CEO, Alan brought his son, Jake, into the business after he finished college a couple years ago and started him off like everyone else so he could learn the ropes. He did, and was quickly promoted to his current position as the regional manager, reporting only to Alan and the board of directors. Of course, at some point, Jake would become the CEO. But that was years off. Mark liked and respected Alan. Alan was something of a father figure to him and helped him transition back into civilian life. After being wounded in Iraq, they had met while Mark was undergoing physical therapy. Alan had just finished a meeting with the board of the facility and stopped to watch the Marine veteran as he worked out. Alan saw something in Mark and bought him lunch that day. They discussed many things during that lunch meeting. And Alan was surprised to learn that Mark had finished his four-year business degree. Just days before being shipped off to Iraq. Alan was impressed with the young Marine and offered him a job. Right on the spot. Surprised. Mark accepted the offer and went to work for Alan the next Monday. That was almost eight years ago. Mark finished his therapy and focused on his work. Taking night classes to get his MBA. Then Allison came along. He was smitten with her the day they first met. After verifying there would be no repercussions from HR. He asked her on a date. They dated for a few months, fell in love and eventually married. Alan surprised Mark by paying for their honeymoon to Hawaii. Three years after they married, Alan brought Jake on board. Mark had hoped something of the old man had rubbed off on Jake. But he learned early on that wasn't quite the case. Jake liked to drop dimes. Letting others around him know who his father was and that one day, he would be the one in the big corner office on the top floor. Jake managed to somehow alienate pretty much everyone around him. One day, Alan spoke to Mark about his son and expressed the same concern Mark had heard from others, you know. I'm going to have to make him the regional manager at some point, Mark, Alan said. I know, Mark said, I'm counting on you to lead by example. Maybe you can help Jake transition into the job a bit, Alan said. Think you can do that? I think so, Alan, Mark said. It won't be easy, though. Okay, I will, Mark said. He's too full of himself to be effective, in my opinion. He refuses to listen to others. Spends far too much time flirting with the girls and likes to throw his name around. Allison tells me he's pretty much a sexual harassment lawsuit. Waiting to happen. He not only likes to chase the women. He likes to brag about it as well. Alan shook his head. I was afraid of that, he said. His mother doted on him from the time he was born. Let him get away with darn near everything. I had hoped bringing him on board might help him mature a bit. I'll have a talk with him. So when is Bill going to retire? I asked. Bill Collins, the current regional manager, had been with the company for years and everyone like him. He had been talking retirement for a while and bought a place up in North Idaho so he and his wife could retire in the country while he was still young enough to enjoy himself. Sometime in the next six months or so, Alan said. He's dead set on it. Personally, I don't blame him. Alan left the office with a promise to stay in touch. Mark knew he would make good on that promise. Here were other things Mark saw in Jake. That he didn't tell the old man. Thinking back on it, 
he realized he probably should have. Bill retired a few months after that discussion and Alan moved Jake into his position. It didn't take long for Jake to make changes. Some of them were good, but Mark wasn't so certain about others. He continued to do his job, though, and tried not to let Jake trouble him too much. Jake did change as he grew into the position, but Mark didn't like what he saw. Jake tended to micromanage things, oftentimes to the irritation of the more experienced members of the team. He also liked to move people around a lot, sometimes into positions that pretty much set them up for failure. One day, a little more than seven months ago, Jake came into Mark's office. He plopped himself into the chair across from Mark as he was on the phone with a client. When Mark hung up, he looked up to see Jake smirking at him. What can I do for you, Jake? Mark asked. I've been thinking about hiring an Anui. He said. And I think Allison would fit that role quite nicely. My wife. Mark asked. That Allison? Jake nodded his head, the smirk never leaving his face. One and the same, Jake said. What's wrong with Gretchen? Mark asked. Gretchen Wilson had served four years as Bill Z. Nothing. Jake said. It's just that she's looking to retire in a bit. And the office could use some new blood. I, how, Mark thought to himself. More like new eye candy for Jake. Have you talked to Allison about it? Mark asked, not yet, he said. I wanted to get with you first. Hi. Mark asked. I appreciate that, but why? I wanted to know what she's like, Jake said. After all, you live with her. You sleep with her every night. I mean, is she bitchy and demanding, or is she always the happy, bubbly type? Is she playful or serious? I want to know what I'm in for if I bring her in. Mark didn't like the way this discussion was going at all. Well, Jake, Mark said. First of all, Allison and I are very happily married and yes. She's always a joy to be around. Second of all, She's married dot to me. Third, she's a professional. If you think she's qualified for the job, then offer it to her. Whether she accepts or not is up to her. But the most important thing to remember is this. She's married dot to me. Mark deliberately repeated himself. To make sure Jake understood his position, I get it, Jake said. You've probably heard the gossip and you're concerned. I would be too if I was married to someone as beautiful as Allison. If she takes the job, it would mean travel, sometimes overnight. Are you okay with that? I trust my wife, Mark said. If she accepts the job, knowing that's part of it, then she knows the boundaries. And I expect you to respect those boundaries. And my marriage. Of course, Mark, old buddy, Jake said. The smirk never leaving his face. I know you and my old man are tight. He respects you and so do I. Believe me, I'd never do anything to get between you and Allison. I hope not, Mark said. Who knows, Jake said. There might even be a promotion in it for you as well. That night, Mark spoke with Allison. Did you speak with Jake today? He asked as she put the finishing touches on their dinner. Yeah, she said. He mentioned something about wanting me to be his newie. And what do you think about that? Mark asked, well, it would mean some travel and probably some late hours, but it would also mean a nice raise. She said, we could certainly use the extra money, especially if we're going to have children someday. Why, are you concerned about something? I just remember you telling me that he was a sexual harassment lawsuit waiting to happen. Mark said, do you still feel the same way? I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't concerned, she said. I do hear all the rumors, you know. Do you trust me? He looked at her before answering. Of course, I trust you. He said, but I trust him about as far as I can throw him. He came by my office today and asked how you are at home. I thought it was a bit impertinent, personally. That's just the way he is, she said. What did you tell him? She asked. Her eyebrows raised. I told him you're a joy to be your own, and I meant it, Mark said. I also let it be known that you and I are happily married. 
and I would expect him to respect that. I would expect nothing less myself, she said. Good, Mark said. So, are you going to take the job? I think so, she responded. We went to bed that night and made love before falling asleep. She took the job, and as predicted, was gone at least once every two weeks for up to two days at a time. She also ended up working late at least three nights a week. Mark dealt with it as best he could, and did all he could to support Allison in her new role. He kept an eye out, but saw nothing that suggested she was anything but professional in her new job. Then the unthinkable happened a little more than three months ago. Alan suffered a massive stroke one day in his office. Paramedics were called, and he was rushed to the hospital, but he didn't last the night. He passed away, having never regained consciousness. Everyone in the company was devastated by the news and attended his funeral. Mark and Allison were surprised at how many people were there. Jake thought his father's untimely death meant he would immediately move into Allen's office and take over as CEO, but the board of directors thought otherwise, saying Jake was far too inexperienced for that role. Over Jake's vehement objections, the board brought on David Matheson to serve as an interim CEO until such time that a suitable replacement could be named. Jake became a changed man after that and set out to prove he was ready for the helm. He had Allison working almost every night until late and made her accompany him nearly every weekend on trips out of town. It didn't matter if Mark and Allison had plans or not. The schedule was taking its toll on both of them, and their marriage suffered as a result. For starters, their sex life almost disappeared completely. He also noticed changes in Allison's wardrobe, where she had normally worn business and professional attire. She was now wearing clothes that were a bit more revealing. On top of that, her attitude toward him had changed somewhat. She had always been outgoing, friendly, bubbly and respectful. But now, she was a bit more demanding. Short-tempered and had started tossing little digs at him. He thought that perhaps it was simply from the stress of her job. Finally, one Sunday when Allison returned from a weekend trip to New York. He sat her down for a talk. Allison, he said. We need to talk. About what? She said with an edge in her voice. About us, he said. I rarely ever see you anymore. This schedule Jake has you on is not just killing you. It's killing us. We need to take some time off and reconnect. I'm sorry, she said. Jake has a lot going on right now. Things are crazy. I can't help it. Tell Jake you're taking a week's vacation, he said. You have the time. We need to do this if we're going to survive. Allison said nothing for a few moments. As she collected her thoughts, he could tell this was bothering her as well. Finally, she nodded her head. You're right, Mark, she said. I could use a break. Jake's been running my ass ragged these last three months. I'll talk to him tomorrow, promise. Please do, Mark said dot the next day. Allison came home happier than he had seen her in a long time. What happened? Mark asked. I talked to Jake like I told you. And he agreed we need to take a breather, she said. He said we could both take next week off if we want. So long as we attend a party at his place Friday night. Party? Mark asked. What kind of party? It's just a little get-together with him and some of his friends, she said. Mark didn't feel comfortable with this partly. He really didn't care for the little twerp. But also because he didn't feel it appropriate to be partying with his boss. As the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. Plus, he didn't know who else would be at this get-together. Do you know any of these people? Mark asked. I've met some of them, she said. They're mostly friends of his from college. But one or two of them work for clients. I don't know who else is coming, though. I see, Mark said. Well, all right. But only if you can get home at a normal hour this week. Can you do that? I think so, she said. We do have to work on the Henderson account on Wednesday, though. Jake is having a dinner meeting with them. And he wants me to be there. He was aware of the Henderson manufacturing account. It had become something of a priority. 
since it was something Alan started handling before his stroke. Okay, Mark said. Wednesday night, but the rest of the week. I want you home at a normal hour, Deal. She smiled and wrapped her arms around him. Deal, she whispered, kissing him on the lips. The next afternoon, Jake showed up at Mark's office and as usual. Sat down in the chair in front of the desk, across from Mark. As usual, he had that never-ending smirk on his face. What can I do for you, Jake? Mark asked. Ali tells me you guys are on for Friday night. Jake said, Ali. Mark wondered. Where did that come from? He called her that once and she let him know in no uncertain terms. That she hated that name. Yes, we discussed it briefly last night, Mark said. Provided she gets home at a decent hour the rest of the week. And we get next week off to reconnect. Of course, Jake said. We do have that dinner meeting with the folks from Henderson on. Wednesday, but I promise, no late nights the rest of the week. What kind of a party is this? Mark asked. And who all is going to be there? It's just a casual get-together, Jake said. A few of my old college buddies will be there. One of them works for a client, but it's nothing fancy. Come casual. You don't need to bring anything. Except Ali, of course. Mark took that in and nodded his head. Jake wasn't finished. By the way, Mark, old buddy, Jake said. Causing Mark to wince inside. You were right. Ali is a joy to be with. I appreciate you letting her take the time she needs to do her job. Without giving her a lot of crap. She's quite good at what she does. Frankly, I'd be lost without her. Mark didn't quite know how to take that. I'm glad you're satisfied with her work, Jake, he said. One thing, though. What's that? Jake asked. Do you call her Ellie to her face? Mark asked. Of course, he said. Why? Just curious, Mark said. That's all. That night, he mentioned it to Allison while they were eating. Do you always let Jake call you Ollie? He asked. I'm just curious, cause you never let me call you that. I figure he's my boss, and he can call me whatever he wants. Allison said. Mark dropped it, but it still ate at him. The rest of the week went pretty well. And except for Wednesday night. She was home right on time, and they made love every chance they got. That Friday. After Mark threw on a pair of jeans and a casual shirt, he watched Allison get ready for the party and noticed the dress she chose to wear. He had never seen this dress before and wondered when she got it. It was much shorter than her other dresses and seemed to show off a lot of skin. He also noticed the new thong she put on. He had never seen this thong before. Then she threw on the dress, not bothering to wear a bra. This was definitely something different. After she had the dress on, he took it all in. It was shorter on one side than the other. And had slits up the sides from her waist to her arms. He could see why she chose not to wear a bra. The front exposed a lot of flesh, and the back was open to a point right above her ass. Almost revealing her thong. He could see her B-cup breasts swell against the material and her nipples threatened to poke. Through the thin fabric. Well, Mark said. You look good enough to eat. Maybe we should stay home and play. She smiled. No, no, she said. After we get home. By the way, where did you get that dress? Mark asked. I've never seen it before. It sure doesn't look casual to me. I got it the last time we were in New York, she said. Jake asked me to wear it tonight. Of course, he thought. Better be careful. Mark said. Someone might get the wrong idea. She chuckled at that. I don't think so, she said. Everyone knows their boundaries. They'd better, Mark said, giving his wife a hug. He started to kiss her, but she waved him off. Later, she said. I don't want my makeup messed up. They drove to Jake's two-story townhouse. Located in a fairly ritzy part of town and rang the doorbell. Jake opened the door and invited them inside. Mark detected the faint odor of marijuana. And had a sinking feeling. Three other young men about Jake's age came into the front room. And Jake introduced them to Mark. 
My God, Allie, you look so fucking hot in that dress, he said. I knew you would. Doesn't she look fucking hot, guys? He asked, turning to the other three men. They all nodded their heads. Their tongues nearly dragging on the floor. Allison smiled and turned around as if modeling the dress for them. They whistled their appreciation. Mark had to admit, she did look good. But he didn't care too much for Jake's reaction. Where are my manners? Jake asked, here. Let me get you to something to drink. Ali, I know you like white wine. What about you, Mark? That's fine for me as well, Mark said. I really don't drink much these days. Very low tolerance to alcohol. Mark really didn't have a low tolerance to alcohol. The truth was that he could probably drink these bozos. Under the table. He all but quit drinking years ago, while he was in the Marines. In reality, he was a mean drunk. And nearly killed a much bigger man with his bare hands the last time he got drunk. After that, he swore it would never happen again. No problem, Jake said. I'll be right back. Jake came back with two glasses and handed them to Mark. And Allison. Allison took a big swig from hers while Mark took very small sips. Mark's internal red flag was waving. And he swore to remain as sober as possible. Something about all this didn't sit right with him. Jake invited everyone to take a seat in his living room. So Mark followed Allison and noticed that she sat on a love seat. He started to sit next to her, but Jake beat him to the punch. Instead, he took a seat on a couch that faced the love seat and watched his wife carefully. Jake looked at him for a moment. Sorry, old buddy, he said. Force of habit. I'm used to sitting on this side of the love seat. No problem, Mark said, looking at his wife. She looked back, but couldn't read his face. They sat for a while engaging in small talk. Jake looked at Mark before he spoke up. My dad told me you were in the Marines, he said. Is that right? Mark nodded his head, yeah. I served five years before I got a medical discharge, he said. John looked at Mark. Marines, huh? He asked. I hear they're real badasses. You ever see any combat? Ever kill anyone? Mark slowly nodded his head. He hated it when people asked that, yeah, he said quietly. What, see combat or kill anyone? John asked. Both, Mark said. Allison looked at him, surprised. He never told her any of this before. He spent the last several years trying to forget about all that. You never told me that, she said. It's not something I like to talk about, he said. George pulled out a large plastic bag. Mark recognized it as marijuana. It was legal to purchase in this state. But he never cared for it much, having tried it once while in high school. Hey, George said. I scored some really good shit. You guys want to try some? Yeah, sure, Jake said. The others, including Allison agreed. Mark had never known her to smoke anything, especially marijuana. George rolled a large joint and lit it up. He passed it around, and the others took a hit off of it. Mark held up his hand and shook his head. When Alan offered it to him, thanks, but no, he said, I never really cared for it. Alan nodded his head and passed it to Jake. Jake took a hit and looked at Mark. A-W-W, -W, come on, Mark, he said. Lighten up a bit. You go ahead, Mark said. I'd like to keep a clear head tonight. You're lost. Man, he said. Besides, this is a party. If you get too fucked up, you can always stay here. Hell, you're gonna be off next week anyway. He turned to Allison. Shotgun. He asked. Mark was surprised when she smiled and eagerly nodded her head. Sure, she said. Jake put the lit end of the joint in his mouth. And Allison opened her mouth as he blew a huge amount of smoke into her. She inhaled it all, coughing just a bit. She patted her chest as she inhaled. That is some good shit, she said. Mark was stunned and wondered who this woman was. Jake handed the joint back to George. You know, Jake said, pointing a finger at Mark. This man is without question the best business analyst in the company. Hell, he saved us millions of dollars in lost revenue. 
Not only that, but if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have this lovely creature as my assistant. Allison smiled at him. And Mark noticed it wasn't just the kind of smile one gives in response to a compliment. There was something else. He also noticed the way she seemed to hang on his every utterance. In fact, Jake said, looking at Mark. I like to think of her as my work wife. He patted Allison's bare thigh. And Mark thought he saw Jake's hand start to inch under her short dress. Mark saw Allison's face flush for just a moment. Before Jake pulled his hand back. Truth is, I'd be lost without her. Jake added, so would I. Mark said, watching Jake's reaction. He couldn't help but notice that Allison looked down at the floor. For just a moment, if you'll excuse me for just a bit, I need to use the restroom. Mark added, breaking the silence in the room. Sure, Jake said. Just go down the hall, first door on the left. Mark got up and walked into the bathroom. Locking the door behind him, he looked in the mirror for a moment. A million thoughts running through his head. Prime among them was the idea. That Allison was cheating on him with Jake. Jake was right about one thing Mark was a damn good analyst. But that was because he paid attention to detail. It was something Ellen taught him when he first started. Remember, son, it's not just numbers. In any business dealing, the devil's always hiding in the details. The old man told him. Pay attention to the details. Trust your gut and you'll never go wrong. Mark took the old man's words to heart. And they always served him well. Now, he had other details to think about. First, there was Allison's dress, or lack thereof. Second, there was the interaction between her and Jake. Third, her drug use, he had never known her to use drugs. And they had never even experimented with them before, but here she was. Eagerly accepting what Jake gave her, then there was her reaction to Jake's touch and Jake's own. Words. What was it he called her? His work wife. What the hell was that all about? Then there were all the little niggling things. He had noticed over the last three months, added together, it all spelled trouble. And if he was right, it also meant the end of his marriage. He sensed that something was going to happen. And knew he had to get out of there with something tangible he could use as proof. He considered simply taking Allison and leaving. But he had a feeling it would only cause a fight and delay the inevitable. He saw his cell phone in his shirt pocket. And noticed the camera lens peeked out over the top of the pocket. That's it, he thought. He pulled the phone out and started a video recording before placing it back in his pocket. After he did his business, he flushed the toilet and washed his hands. He steeled himself before he opened the door. As he walked into the front room, he noticed Allison suddenly sit up after leaning over the coffee table. He saw a few specks of white powder on her nose and realized she had probably sniffed a line of cocaine. Jake also had a bit of white powder on his nose. As did the other three men. He sat down and saw the guilty look on her face. He picked up his glass and took a small sip when he spotted undissolved granules. Of some kind of powder in the bottom of his glass. What the hell? He quickly set the glass back down on the table. And noticed everyone looking at him. He started to say something but suddenly found himself very tired and unable to say anything coherent. Are you okay? He heard Allison ask. He looked at her, confused, unable to speak. Jake and the three men stood up. Allison stood up with them and grabbed Jake's arm. He looked at them all, wondering what they were going to do next. He tried to stand, but was unable to. Why don't you just take a little nap for a while, Mark? Old buddy. Jake asked as the other men put his feet up on the couch. Mark was unable to do or say anything as Allison removed his shoes. He wanted to get up, grab her and run out as fast as he could. He looked around, trying to find anything he could to support himself and saw her thong on the love seat, where she and Jake were sitting. The bitch, he thought. Allison came over to him and covered him with an afghan. He wanted to grab her by the throat but couldn't move his arms. She leaned down and kissed him on the forehead. I'm sorry, Mark. She whispered in his ear, I really do love you, and able to keep his eyes open. 
he fell into a deep sleep. The whole place was dark when he awoke. He rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and looked around. It seemed no one was awake. He listened and heard nothing but the sound of snoring. Coming from upstairs. Glancing at his phone. He realized he had been out for a little more than three hours. He stopped the video recording. And put the phone back in his pocket. He crept upstairs and glanced in the master suite. Making sure he stayed in the shadows. He saw Allison, nude, on Jake's bed. Her arm over his chest and one leg over his. He could see cum dripping out of her and was disgusted. One of the three men was also naked and laying next to Allison. On the large bed. The other two men were also asleep. One on a couch under the window and the other positioned precariously in an overstuffed recliner. Sitting in one corner, he crept quietly back downstairs. He wanted to find out what it was they had dosed him with. So, he rummaged around in Jake's kitchen until he found a Tupperware container with a screw-on lid. He poured the drink in the container and sealed it up tight. Going back in the front room, he pulled Allison's keychain from her purse and noticed a key he never saw before. It looked like a house key, but it wasn't one of theirs. Acting on a hunch, he pulled the key off and stuffed it in his pocket. Then he had another thought and grabbed Allison's phone. Putting it in his pants pocket, he planned on going through it later on. Pulling his wedding ring off, he set it carefully on the top of her purse so she would easily see it. He put his shoes back on and crept to the door. Details, he thought to himself. He looked around but didn't see a security system or a console anywhere near the door. Opening the front door, he tried the key he took off Allison's ring. It fit perfectly, just as he thought it might. He quietly closed the door behind him, locking it with her key. He got in his car, closing the door as quietly as he could. He backed out of the driveway and left. Not turning his lights on until he was on the street, he had an idea and pulled into a convenience store. He pulled out his phone and looked up his old friend, R.K. Evans, in the service. Mark knew him as Corporal Evans. But all his friends simply called him R.K. after he left the service. He started his own private investigative firm and Mark helped him with the financial details. Hello, a sleepy R.K. said when he answered the phone. Hey, R.K. It's me, Mark, Mark said. Sorry to call so late, but I need your help. What's up, Mark? R.K. asked. You get in a bar fight and need me to bail you out or something. Not quite, Mark said. Can you be at my place in about 15 or 20 minutes? Yeah, sure, R.K. said. Everything all right. What's going on? I'd rather not talk about it over the phone, Mark said. Gotcha, R.K. said. I'll see you in about 20 minutes. Thanks, buddy, Mark said. I appreciate it. Hey, Semper Fee, do or die right? R.K. asked. Mark chuckled. R.K. liked to say that a lot. Ura, Mark said. They ended the call and Mark looked at the store. Fuck it, he thought to himself. He bought a 12-pack of beer and a couple packs of cigarettes. He hadn't smoked since he left the service, but at this point, he felt he needed to do something before he punched something or someone out. He got home and put the beer in his refrigerator, grabbing one for himself. He opened a pack of cigarettes and lit one up after he sat on the couch, using a candy dish that had their picture on the inside for an ashtray. It was a wedding gift to them, and Allison liked to keep it stocked with little candies and treats. He didn't care if Allison complained about the smell. Especially after what happened earlier. About that time, he heard the doorbell and so it was R.K. He invited his old friend inside and offered him a beer. What's up, man? R.K. asked as he opened his beer. Mark filled him in on what happened earlier in the evening. Holy fuck, R.K. said when Mark finished. Mark handed him the container that held the dosed wine. Think you can get that analyzed? He asked. R.K. nodded his head, yeah. But it'll probably be Monday or Tuesday before I can get results, R.K. said. I also need everything you can get me on Jake Marcus. John Whitehead, George Franklin and Alan Jenkins, Mark said. 
I understand Jenkins works for Henderson Manufacturing. I don't know what he does there. He pulled out his phone and brought up the video from earlier. He scanned through it until he found a frame. That showed all four of them. Here's a picture of them. I know it's not the best. Got it, RK said. You want surveillance from inside his place as well as yours. Yeah, if you can swing it, Mark said. I've got a key if you want it. I didn't see any security system, but that doesn't mean anything. RK took the key and looked at it. No problem, he said. How did you get this, by the way? I took it off Allison's keychain, Mark told him. RK nodded his head. You realize you probably won't be able to use any video from inside his place as evidence, right? RK asked. I figured as much, Mark said. This is personal. I really don't give a shit about what's legal or not right now. I understand, RK said. Mark handed RK an extra key to his house. Here's a key for this place, Mark said. He wrote down a four-digit number and handed it to him. And this is the code for my security system. I don't think I'll need the key. If you want, I can set up some equipment while I'm here, RK said. Handing the key back. Hide of cameras, audio, the works. Hell, I can even record what gets said on your landline. Do it, Mark said. How much is all this going to cost me? Don't worry about it, RK said. You saved my ass over there in Iraq. This is the least I can do for you. Thanks, old friend, Mark said. At least let me cover your costs. All right, if you insist, RK said. What else have you got? You showed me part of the video you took. Why don't we go through some of it? And see if we can get some clues. Mark pulled the video back up and started it from the beginning. Stop right there, RK said. Mark paused the video. Can you back it up just a bit? Mark did as RK asked and they watched again. The camera clearly picked up Allison finishing a line of cocaine. That was laid out on the coffee table. Mark stopped the video. Damn, he said. I saw her just as she sat back up. But that clearly looks like cocaine on the table. Yes, it does, RK said. Interesting. Have you ever known Allison to use before? Mark shook his head. No, never, he said. Okay. Let's see what else is on here, RK said. Mark started the video again, and they could tell. When Mark sat on the couch across from Allison. Hold up, RK said. Mark paused the video again. What's that? He asked, pointing to something on the love seat. Mark looked closely and saw it was Allison's thong. Holy shit, he said. I saw that right before I passed out. But I thought I was just seeing things. I'll bet she took it off right after I got up to use the bathroom. He started the video back up and they could tell. When the drug had started to affect Mark. They saw the camera pointing up as he laid down. And watched as the four others looked down at him. They heard Allison ask if he was okay and Jake telling him to take a nap. Then they saw Allison lean over him and whisper in his ear. Mark remembered this. But he had no recollection of what they heard next. You sure you don't want to tie him up and make him watch us? George asked. No, Allison said. This is enough for one night. We have all week, you know. We can always step things up. If he doesn't go along with the program, Jake said. You know, John swings both ways. Maybe he could introduce O.L. Mark to the joy of gay sex. He added to laughter. Mark felt his face turn red as he heard Allison join them. Now that's something I'd like to see, she said. Really? They heard John ask. You'd let me fuck your husband in this? Sure, why not, she said. Maybe if you're nice. You can get him to give you a nice sloppy blowjob while I peg him with a big black dildo. They all laughed again. Well, I've never done a marine before. John said. I doubt he can give as good a blowjob as you, though. Mark fought back the urge to throw his phone through the wall. Seriously, Jake, is he gonna be okay? You didn't give him too much, did you? Allison asked. Now. He'll be fine, Jake said. He'll sleep for about 12 hours, wake up with a bit of a headache. He'll think he just drank too. Much. 
Tomorrow I'll introduce him to the really hard stuff. By this time next week. All Mark here will be a full-fledged sex-loving addict. Maybe I'll even have him work the street for me. To bad dear old dad isn't around to see his golden boy fall. Is that why you hate him so much? We heard Allison ask. That's all I heard about while I was in college, Jake said. About how good old Mark went to school while serving his country. And fighting for America. About how he worked to make something of himself. While defending his country, sometimes I thought dad would rather have Mark as a son than me. Well, guess what, dad? I'm Mark's boss now. I have Mark's woman. And by this time next week, your golden boy will be a cock-sucking drug addict. They all laughed at that. Are you boys with me on this? He asked. We heard the three of them say yes. What about you, Allie? Are you with me? Because if you're not, tell me now and I promise you'll be on the street with him. I'm with you, sweetie, Allison said. Besides, I've grown to love this too much to walk away from it. We assumed she was referring to Jake's manhood, as we couldn't see what she was referring to. All right then, Jake said, come on. Let's go upstairs and get the real party started, goody, Allison said as they headed up the stairs. This time I want you guys to make me airtight. There was no movement in the video, but they could hear the sounds of sex coming from the bedroom. Mark ended the video and put his head in his hands. RK put a reassuring hand on his shoulder. I know this is gonna be rough on you, but we'll get you through this, he said. Mark nodded his head. Thanks, RK, he said. What are you gonna do? RK asked. I'm divorcing her. There's no question about that. Mark said. I understand, RK said. Why don't you get away from here for a few days? Let me and the boys handle this. What do you plan on doing? Mark asked, it's probably best if you don't know, R.K. said. I can tell you this. We just witnessed a criminal conspiracy. If I have my way, someone will go to jail. But we need to get you out of here for a bit. But I can help you, Mark said. Wick shook his head. No, R.K. said. You're in danger right now and the last thing we need is for you to go off on any of them. Remember old Gunny Johnson? Well. He's retired and in Vegas now. He owes me a favor or three. He said he'd set me up with a place to rack up for a few days. If I ever wanted to visit Vegas, I'll call him and see what he can do for you. Mark nodded his head. Okay, he said. Let me get the place here wired for audio and video. Then I'll head out. You need to maintain. Understand? Mark nodded his head. Thanks, RK. You're a good friend. I appreciate it, Mark said. Wick smiled. Semper fi, bro. Do or die. RK said. Who fucking rob, Mark said. He went on the back porch with a beer as RK wired the front room. And the bedrooms for audio and video. RK also tapped the house phone. He set it up so that all the audio and video would be stored on a cloud server that could be accessed from anywhere on the internet. When he finished, he gave Mark the server address and credentials to access the files. He also showed Mark the switch that would let him turn the surveillance system on and off. I'll call Gunny tomorrow and let you know what he says, RK said. One way or another, we're getting you out of here. Don't do anything stupid, you hear me. I hear you, RK, Mark said. I hope so, Mark, he said. Hang tough, my friend. I'll be in touch. I will, RK, Mark said. Thanks again. For everything. After RK left, Mark turned on his computer and pulled up his bank accounts. He still had one open from before he got married. That was in his name only. Since he married Allison, he deposited 10% of his earnings into that as a rainy day fund. He had hoped to use the money for a cruise. As a surprise gift to Allison, but those days were done. He transferred half of everything out of their joint account into his old account, then paid off and canceled their joint credit cards. He still had a card in his name only from his original account, shutting that down. 
He packed enough clothes to last him a few days and threw the suitcases into his car. Coming inside the house, his gaze fell on the wedding portrait that hung on the wall over the fireplace. Allison looked so beautiful in her wedding dress that day. He was the happiest man on earth. And thought he had hit the jackpot. But no longer, filled with rage at her betrayal. He grabbed a large hunting knife and shredded the portrait. Once finished, he looked her on and pulled down every picture that included Allison. All of them got tossed into the fireplace. He ran upstairs and pulled her wedding dress from the closet. Then tossed that into the fireplace as well. He considered burning it all right then. But decided to wait a bit. At that moment, he was filled with blind seething hatred for her and wanted her to personally witness their marriage going up in flame. Then he had another idea. Grabbing a bottle of beer, he went back to the couch and picked up his phone. He mailed the video to himself and verified it on his laptop. He wrote a very carefully worded letter to each member of the board of directors and David, the interim CEO, explaining in detail what had transpired. He remembered something Ellen had told him before. The board wouldn't respond to well to threats, but they would respond to a careful and thoughtful analysis of any situation. He didn't know David very well, having only spoken to him a few times, but hoped he was as reasonable as the members of the board. Without threatening anyone, he reminded the board that Jake, as an executive, was required to operate under the morals clause of his employment agreement, and his actions, along with those of his wife, were exactly the kind of things the morals clause was written to address. He also reminded them, that their actions were not only criminal in nature, but were the types of things that could spark lawsuits and scandal, the type of scandal that could easily destroy a company like Marcus Financial. He reminded them of his time with the company, telling them of his great respect for Alan. He expressed hope they would do the right thing. He read and reread his letter, editing a few words here and there. When he was satisfied, he wrote an email attaching the letter and the video and sent it to David as well as each member of the board, telling them he would be on vacation for the week, but could be reached by email or phone. He suspected he probably wouldn't hear anything until Tuesday. And by then, he planned to be out of the area. He then sat back, lit up a cigarette and put it in the candy dish, watching as the heat from the lit cigarette burned into Allison's face. At that moment, that's exactly what he wanted to do to her. He picked up her phone and unlocked it. He knew the code since he set it up for her when he first got it. He went through her text messages and got even more furious. It seemed the two of them had been screwing for at least the last six months. But it was only in the last three that Allison began openly disrespecting him to Jake. Of course, he thought. Just the fact that she was screwing him was disrespectful enough. He found a treasure trove of pictures, pictures of a man's erect tool, which Mark had to admit was quite large. He wondered if this was Jake's or if it belonged to someone else. There were other pictures, pictures of Jake and Allison playing kissy face and dancing in a nightclub, perhaps in New York. And pictures of Allison's smeared face surrounded by naked men. Other pictures showed her getting screwed by two men at the same time. One of them showed her getting screwed from the rear by a large black man while Jake was in front of her. He wondered who took the pictures and if they were taken with this phone or another device. She had also stored videos on the phone videos of her having sex with Jake and others, including the three men at the party. No wonder she acted as if she already knew them, he thought. So, this is what she had been doing. While claiming to be on work-related trips, he copied everything he could and emailed it himself using her device. By then, he had downed six beers and smoked half a pack of cigarettes, grinding them out on her face in the bottom of the dish. He looked outside and saw that the sun had already started to rise. Soon, he thought she would be up and would know that he had left. He figured she would be up and about in an hour or two, so he grabbed his shotgun, made sure it was loaded and locked both locks on his door. Then he laid back down on the couch with the shotgun next to him and tried to get some sleep. 
Allison woke up and looked at the clock on the nightstand. Next to Jake's bed. She saw it was 8.30 so she rolled out of bed and went to the bathroom to clean up. Jake and the others began to stir. And were up by the time she got out of the bathroom. Jake threw on a robe and looked at Allison. You want to go downstairs and get some breakfast started? He asked. Mark will probably want some coffee, assuming he's waking up. Yeah, sure, she said. She tossed on a robe, padded downstairs in her bare feet, and went into the kitchen. She started a pot of coffee and walked into the living room to wake up her husband. Then she realized with a start that he wasn't there. The afghan she put over him was thrown back, and his shoes were gone. She ran around the first floor, thinking that perhaps he was in the bathroom, but he wasn't there. Looking out the front window, she realized their car was gone. She turned around and saw his ring sitting on her purse, which was laying on its side on the coffee table. Oh shit, she gasped. She ran upstairs, yelling. Jake stopped her as she ran into the master bedroom. What's wrong? Jake asked. He's gone, she said. What do you mean gone? Jake asked her. He's gone, goddammit, she yelled. He must have woke up in the middle of the night and left. He took the car and left his wedding ring. Shit, Jake said. You'd better call him and see if you can track him down. Tell him he needs to come pick you up. Okay, she said, running back downstairs. She put Mark's ring in her purse and looked for her phone. But it wasn't there. She was certain she had brought it with her last night. She never went anywhere without it. By then, Jake was downstairs. My phone is gone, she said. That's okay, Jake said. Use the house phone. You don't understand, she said. I never go anywhere without it. It's full of texts. Along with the pictures and videos you sent to me. If he has it, he's probably seen them. Don't worry about it, Jake said. What we need to do is get him over here. The boys and I will take things over from there. Now call him. Allison nodded her head. And picked up the phone in Jake's living room. She nervously dialed Mark's cell phone, hoping he would answer, Hello. Mark said when he answered. He sounded as if he had just woke up. Mark, sweetie, it's me. She said, The fuck you want? He growled. Allison recoiled. He had never spoken to her like that before. She realized he must be super pissed. She had no idea. Mark, honey, you weren't here when I got up and I was worried about you, she said. Are you alright? What the fuck do you care, bitch? He asked, sweetheart, I need you to come pick me up at Jake's house. She said, could you do that for me, pretty please? Mark laughed out loud, fuck you cunt. He snarled. I may have been clueless yesterday, but I'm not anymore. And you don't ever get to call me sweetheart or honey. Or anything else ever again. Mark, please, don't be angry with me, she pleaded. I do love you. Yeah, right bitch, Mark said. Tell me another one. Mark, we need to talk, she said. Damn right we do, he said. Then I need you to come to Jake's and pick me up, she said. We can talk about this on the way back home. Wrong answer, cunt, he said, causing her to recoil yet again. There's no way in fucking hell I'm going over there. If you want to come home, you can walk or call an Uber. The only thing we have to talk about is how we're going to split everything up. What do you mean, split everything up? She asked, that's what usually happens in a divorce. Bitch, he said. I don't want a divorce, she said. Please, can't we get through this? I didn't want to be drugged and cuckolded either, he said. Just get your ass home if you feel the need to talk. But I'm warning you. Don't let Jake or any of those other fuckers bring you home. I'm armed and if any of them step foot in my house, I'll blow their fucking heads off, so help me God. You understand me, bitch. You h okay? I'll call an Uber, she said. Do that, Mark said. And make sure you either have cash or your ATM card. Why? she asked. Because your credit card doesn't work anymore, Mark said. 
Why doesn't my credit card work anymore? She asked. Because I cancelled it last night. Said. Oh, she quietly said. By the way, do you happen to know where my phone is? Yeah, it's here on the coffee table, Mark said. Got an interesting collection of pictures and video, by the way. Now, I know what you and fuckwad have been doing these last three months or so when you claim to be on business trips. They'll really help my divorce case. Oh my god, she whispered. Mark, I'm really very sorry, she said. I never wanted to hurt you. Shut up, you cheating 304. And save your worthless excuses for someone who gives a shit, he said. Now, if you want to come and talk to me, do it now while you can. And come alone. I'll be there, Mark, she said, ending the call. Putting the phone down, she looked at Jake. Well, Jake asked. He's not coming, she said. He said I need to go there and talk to him. All right, Jake said. We'll take you, then? She shook her head. No, she said. He's armed and he said if any of you show up, he'd kill you. I think he really means it. You didn't hear him. I've never heard him so angry in my life. Jake thought for a moment, then went into his study. He came back out with a syringe in his hand. Here's what we do. Then, he said, put this in your purse. You call an Uber and we'll follow you to your place. The first chance you get. You pull the cap off and inject it into his arm wall of it. Then you call me. We'll be close by. We'll come and pick him up and put him in the trunk of my car. What is that? She asked. It's just a special concoction I had made up for him, Jake said. Some narcotics, heroin and something to put him out. It acts pretty fast. Don't worry, it won't hurt him. Just stick him with it and when he's out, you call me, got it. He handed her the syringe. And watched as she carefully put it into her purse. Okay, she said. Just promise me you won't hurt him. We'll do our best, Jake said. Right, boys. He added, looking at the three men, who laughed. He turned back to Allison. Go ahead, call for your ride. She arranged for an Uber driver to pick her up in a half hour. And went back upstairs to finish getting ready. When the driver arrived, she got in the car and left. Jake and his three friends got into his car and followed Allison. Parking about a block away. None of them took note of the white van parked on the street. Across from Jake's house, your wife is getting an Uber. And her buddies are going to follow behind. They plan on dosing you with something then kidnapping you. Whatever it is, it's in her purse. Apparently. She's going to hit you with it as soon as she gets a chance. My boys will follow Jake and his crew when they leave. Damn, Mark said. Yeah, RK said. Anyway, just be careful. I'll text you when they leave. Turn on the surveillance gear when she gets there. And I'll monitor it. I'm just down the street. I'll call the cops when the time comes. Just be ready. Okay, Mark said. Thanks. He waited and got the text about a half hour later, on the move. Showtime, Mark said to himself. He knew he had about 20 minutes or so before they arrived. So, he stashed the shotgun where he knew Allison wouldn't spot it right off. And turned the surveillance gear on. He went into the kitchen and grabbed a plastic Ziploc bag. For the syringe and a tissue, he saw the Uber pull up in front of his house. And watched as Allison paid the driver and got out of the car. She seemed exceptionally nervous and kept her hand on her purse. Which was slung over her left shoulder. He hit the switch to turn on the fireplace and watched as the pictures and her dress started to catch on fire. She walked to the door and slowly opened it. She grimaced as she walked in and smelled the cigarette smoke. Mark really didn't care. Her eyes grew wide. When she saw the destroyed portrait over the fireplace and got even wider. When she looked at her dress and photos now turning to ash. My wedding dress, she exclaimed. Our pictures. Mark, why are you doing this? Tears were falling down her face, but he was unmoved. I wanted you to see for yourself what your actions have done to us, he said. She looked at the beer bottles. 
and cigarette butts in her beloved candy dish. I thought you had a low tolerance to alcohol, she said. And I never knew you smoked. I used to smoke, but quit, he said. As for the other, the truth is, I get downright mean when I get drunk. The last time I got really drunk I nearly killed a man. With my bare hands. A much bigger man than me, by the way. I made a choice to never get drunk again. Just like you made a choice to become Jake's whore. Oh my god Mark, she said crying. What have I done? You tell me, he said. What the fuck happened to you? You used to be the sweetest, kindest. Most level-headed person I ever knew. Did you overdose on stupid pills? Did Jake hit you with a Martian slut ray? Since when have you snorted cocaine? And who are all these men you've been fucking? Clients, mostly, she said quietly. Jake made me. Oh fucking terrific, Mark said. You know. Your actions could put Marcus Financial out of business. Tell me. How long have you wanted to drug me and rape me in this? Was that your idea, or is that something Jake put you up to? She looked at him, shocked, I never. She began before Mark cut her off, shut the fuck up cunt, he said, pulling out his phone. He played the video, and let her hear herself. And her accomplices talk as they stood over him. Her face turned white as she heard her own words. How did you get that? She asked, it doesn't matter, he said. What's important is that David and the members of the board now have this video. The police will have it also. Not only are we getting divorced, but if I have my way, you'll be in prison for a very long time. I just want to know why. You don't understand, she said. It's a long story. Maybe you can tell me one day when I'm not so inclined to wring your scrawny neck, Mark said. He watched her as she started to open her purse, but before she could do anything, he ripped it off her shoulder and dumped the contents on the coffee table. He saw the syringe filled with a dark liquid and picked it up with the tissue he had set aside for that purpose. Is this what you had planned for me? He asked. Do you even know what this is? Not exactly, she said, not exactly. He asked sarcastically. You mean to tell me you were going to inject this in me? Without any fucking clue what it really is or what it could do. You're one sick bitch, you know that. Did Jake tell you to do this? She nodded her head. Yes, she said quietly. I suppose if Jake told you to shove a red hot poker up your ass. You'd do that too, wouldn't you? He asked. Let me guess, you're supposed to inject this into me. Then call him when I'm down so he can come kidnap me. Am I right? Ashamed, she nodded her head. Pretty much, she said. All right, Mark said. Here's what we're gonna do. You're going to call Jake. Put it on speaker so I can hear both sides. You're going to tell Jake you did what he asked. I'll take it from there. Don't you dare tell him I'm waiting for him. Got it. You want me to set him up? She asked. Yes. Mark said. Any questions? She shook her head. No, she said. I understand. Good, Mark said. Now do it, and no tricks. Mark watched as she called and put the phone on speaker, Jake. It's me, Allie, she said. It's done, he's out. Good girl, Jake said. We'll be right there. She ended the call and looked at Mark. He's going to kill me when he sees you're not really down and out. He said, tough shit, bitch. Mark said, remember, no signals, nothing to let him know the truth. Otherwise I may kill you myself. He sat in a recliner and waited for Jake to come inside. When he saw Jake and his three buddies through the window, he closed his eyes but left them open just enough so he could see. Jake opened the door and walked inside. He looked around at the mess before starting to come toward Mark. You did good, he told Allison. Now, we're gonna put him in the trunk. Jake reached down to lift Mark. But before he could lay a hand on him, Mark opened his eyes. Before Jake could react, Mark brought up one hand and smashed Jake in the throat. Jake reeled back and Mark stood up. Jake shook his head for a second. 
But Mark was already on the move, and kicked him as hard as he could in the crotch. The other three stepped inside to help Jake, but were detained by Arkay's men, who had followed them onto Mark's property. Jake was on his knees, moaning in pain. Mark slipped behind him and pulled out his hunting knife. As he knelt down, he grabbed Jake's hair and pulled his head up, while positioning the knife at his throat. Make your peace with God, asshole, Mark growled. Because I'm going to cut your motherfucking head off. Jake pissed his pants in fear as Allison recalled in horror. Who was this monster, she asked herself. Jake began pressing the knife against Jake's throat. When he heard Arkay's voice from the door, Sergeant. Arkay shouted, getting everyone's attention. Don't do it. Drop the knife. Police are on their way. This fucking dog deserves to die. Mark exclaimed. By then, R.K. was on one knee in front of Jake. Yes. He's a piece of shit, and he deserves to die, my friend, R.K. said. But not at your hand. Listen to me, Mark. If you kill him, he'll feel nothing ever again. He'll turn to dust in his grave, but you'll end up in prison. You deserve your revenge, but what kind of revenge is that? This isn't Iraq, buddy. Let the authorities do their job, please. I'm asking you as a friend. Put the knife down and let the police take him in. He'll pay for what he's done. They all will. Mark looked at his friend for a minute before responding. He could feel Jake trembling in fear for his life. He slowly pulled the knife away from Jake's throat and stood up behind him. Looking down, he saw Jake crying. RK turned him over and had him lay on the floor, face down. As he zip-tied Jake's hands behind his back, R.K. then turned to Allison and told her to lay on the floor as well. Face down, hands behind her back. She complied and looked in the fireplace as R.K. secured her hands. Hot tears fell down her face as she watched a picture of her. And Mark catch fire and turned to Ash. Mark sat on the couch and watched R.K. make sure both Allison and Jake were secure. The other three were on the front yard. Similarly secured by R.K.'s men, they heard the sirens of the police cruisers. As they stopped in front of Mark's house, hand me your phone, R.K. said. I'll go talk to the police before they come inside. Mark nodded his head and gave R.K. his phone. As R.K. left, Jake lifted his head and turned to face Mark. His smirk was finally gone. Apparently all it took was the thought that he was about to die. You know, my father always did love you more than he did me, Jake said. Mark shook his head. Not true, Jake, Mark told him. He always hoped you would mature enough to step into his shoes one day. Would you really have cut my head off? Jake asked. I guess we'll never know now, will we? Mark asked in response. But I guarantee you, where you're going, you'll be surrounded by people who won't hesitate the way I did. And I promise if you ever come after me like this again, I won't hesitate either. Jake laid his head back on the floor and said nothing. Three large police officers came into the house and surveyed the situation, picking Jake and Allison up. They read them their Miranda rights and marched them out to the cruisers. One officer looked at the syringe laying on the coffee table and its plastic bag and picked it up. Is this what they plan to use on you? He asked Mark. Double quotes, yes, it is, he said. The officer made notes as he took Mark's full statement. After about a half hour, he turned to Mark. You were lucky, you know that, don't you? He asked, now, Mark said. My fellow Marine had my back. The officer smiled and nodded his head, sympathy. The officer said, shaking Mark's hand, aura, Mark said in response. After they left, R.K. came into the front room and sat on the couch. You got another one of those? He asked, pointing at the beer bottles. I think I have one or two left, Mark said. Kinda early for this, don't you think? After this shit, no, R.K. said as Mark handed him a cold bottle. How are you holding up? Okay, Mark said. I feel like I did back in Iraq, though. I guess I need to decompress a bit. Yeah about that, R.K. said. I talked to Gunny this morning. He said he'd take care of everything. 
if you wanted to go hang out in Vegas for a few days. Told me to give you his number. I may just do that, Mark said. I have a few things to take care of here first, though. RK pulled a couple of cards out of his pocket and handed them to Mark. There's Gunny's number if you want to call, he said. The other card is for a divorce lawyer I do work for. Michelle Hawkins. She's a real shark. Hates cheaters with a passion. I took the liberty of calling her this morning. She said she's expecting you at her office. At 8 o'clock a.m. sharp Monday morning. Thanks, Mark said, nodding his head. For everything. Hey, Semper Fi, bro. Do or die, RK said. Mark chuckled at that. Oh, fucking raw, he said in response. After they finished their beer, RK stood up and looked around. Looks like you got a bit of cleaning to do here, so I'll be on my way, he said. See ya. My friend, Mark said. I'll be by later to get all the surveillance gear. RK left and Mark turned to the job of cleaning the house. That afternoon, he got a call from David Matheson. Mark. This is David Matheson, the older man said when Mark answered the phone. Yes, mister. Matheson, what can I do for you? Mark asked. You can start by calling me David, he said. I got your email and looked at the video. So did the board members. We're all in agreement with what you said in your letter, which, I must say, was quite impressive. Thank you, David, Mark said. You're welcome, he answered. We also agreed that both Allison and Jake's employment should be terminated immediately especially given that they're both in custody right now. I'm heading to the county jail to take care of that personally. There's a couple other things. What's that? Mark asked. We think it would be good if you took a few days to go somewhere, let off a bit of steam. David said. You have some place you'd like to go for a bit. A friend of mine said he'd look after me in Vegas for a few days. Mark said. I have an appointment with a divorce lawyer Monday. Then, I'll be looking to head out. Vegas, ha? Huh? David asked. Well, I can't think of a better place to get your mind off all this than Vegas. Have a good trip, Mark, and we'll see you a week from Monday. Thanks, David, I will, Mark said. There's just a couple other things, David said. We unanimously agreed that with Jake's departure, you would be the best person for his job, me. Hey. Mark asked. Absolutely, David said. We're very impressed with the way you dealt with this. And the board has had its eye on you for a while. I don't mind telling you, they're very happy with your work. Of course. There'll be a nice increase and a few other benefits along with that promotion. But I think you deserve it. Thanks, David, Mark said. Don't thank me just yet, David said. The first thing we need for you to do is oversee the external audit we're going to have done. We're bringing in auditors from an external outfit to go over everything Jake has touched since he's been here. They'll report directly to you and you'll report those findings. Good, bad or indifferent to me. I think that's a good idea, Mark said. I've learned since I sent that email that Jake has had Allison engage in sex with some of our clients. Good God, David said. Well, I'll leave that in your capable hands. In the meantime, you have a good trip and we'll see you a week from Monday. See you then, David, Mark said. Thanks. After the call from David, Mark finished cleaning the house. Then mowed the yard as he usually did on Saturdays. He called Gunny Johnson afterward. And the two of them caught up on everything. So, you want to come out for a few days and have a bit of fun? Gunny asked. Yeah, sure, Mark said. All right, Gunny said. Come on out. I'll set you up with a nice room and show you the ropes. Then you're on your own. And please remember, this is Las Vegas, not Bangkok. They laughed over that. I'll remember, Gunny, Mark said. See you on Monday evening. See you, Mark, Gunny said. RK stopped by and gathered his equipment. Just wanted to give you a little update, RK said. Cops searched Jake's place and hit a gold mine. A shitload of drugs, paraphernalia, sex toys, DVDs, you name it. Seems old Jake was a real pervert. 
Friend of mine on the forest said he wouldn't be surprised. If there was child porn and all that stuff they picked up. Damn, Mark said. RK stayed for dinner and Mark fell asleep shortly afterward, exhausted both mentally and physically. The next day, he set about tossing all of Allison's things into trash bags. He hauled them to the garage and decided to wait on taking it all to Goodwill until he knew for certain that she would be going to prison. As he was emptying out her dresser drawers, he came across an extremely large black strap on dildo. He figured the studded phallus had to be a good 14 inches in length and nearly as big around as a baseball bat. He wondered if this was what she planned to use on him and shuddered at the thought. He also found a strange looking device he was unable to identify. After doing a search on the internet, he realized it was a male chastity device or a chastity cage. Was there no limit to her depravity? He wondered. He finished packing her stuff in trash bags and put it all in the garage. The next morning, he was at Michelle Hawkins' office right at 8 o'clock and was escorted right inside. She looked over his evidence and paperwork and made notes as he talked. She informed him of California's divorce laws and explained that everything is generally divided equally. Since they had no children, she explained, and the house was his before their marriage the court would probably allow him to keep the house. Since he had already split their bank accounts, she said, the court would most likely give the half still in their account to Allison. She also explained that her adultery could not be brought up in the divorce, however. The criminal accusations against Allison would quite probably be considered by the judge in any order. She also said it was highly unlikely he would have to pay Allison any support while she is incarcerated, however. That could change when she gets released. I'll do everything I can to make this as painless as possible. Michelle said, I'll draw up the papers and have them served, if she signs them as is. I'll present them to the judge. From there, it's a matter of waiting six months. Mark agreed and gave her a retainer for her work before he left. He stopped by the county jail on his way home to let Allison know. He was filing for divorce. He sat at the table and watched as they brought her out. She looked haggard and the orange jumpsuit didn't exactly flatter her figure. They picked up the handset so they could communicate. Since they were separated by a thick plexiglass shield. Hello, Allison, Mark said. Double quotes hello, Mark, she responded. I just wanted to let you know I saw an attorney today and I'm filing for divorce, he said. I figured you would, she said. When is your arraignment hearing? He asked her. Tomorrow morning, she told him. The prosecuting attorney is asking that we be held without bail. I think that would probably be best, he told her. Tell me something, and I want the God's honest truth. What's that? She asked. What the fuck happened to you? He asked her. She looked down, embarrassed. Things were going quite good with the job at first, she said. Jake seemed to be just like any other executive. Things didn't really start until after Ellen passed away. Jake was furious that he didn't get promoted, and he blamed you. Said his father had probably set things up for you to get that job. That's crazy, Mark said. Alan always said he hoped Jake would become the CEO one day. I know, she said. We went to New York that weekend, and that's when it all started. We were at a club with some people from one of our clients. Dancing and drinking. Nothing too outlandish. Yeah, I flirted a bit, but I didn't think I was out of line. The next thing I know. I started feeling really good, and before you know it I was in bed with two of the other guys. Jake joined in later. She paused for a moment before continuing. The next morning I realized what had happened. And I felt really guilty about it, she said. Then Jake showed me some pictures and video that he had taken. And said I would have to do whatever he wanted or he would make sure you got them. So, he blackmailed you, Mark said. And I'll bet he drugged you as well. He did, she said. He admitted it to me later. I'm not surprised, Mark said. They found a ton of drugs in his place. Including a lot of date rape drugs. Is he the one who got you on cocaine? She nodded her head. 
Yes, she said. And marijuana. And some other stuff. So how many of our clients did you end up fucking? Mark asked. She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, she said. Several. Jake set it all up and that's pretty much what I did. Whenever we went anywhere. Mark shook his head. I found a couple of your toys, Mark said. Is that what you planned on raping me with? She started crying. Yes, she said through her tears. I'm sorry. I really didn't want to. Looked to me like you were pretty excited about the whole idea, Mark said. Drugging me, raping me. Turning me into a gay prostitute for Jake's amusement. Tell me. Was Wednesday's dinner really about the Henderson project? She shook her head. No, she said. We were planning Friday's party. So you planned all that out in advance? Mark asked. Allison nodded her head. Yes, she said quietly. I'm sorry, Mark. Yeah. That's about the first thing you've said that I agree with, he told her. Do you think you can ever forgive me? She asked. He chuckled before he answered, not no, but hell no, he said. You cheated on me with that asshole and God only knows. How many others? Then you plotted with him to have me drugged and raped. You're out of your fucking mind. And don't even ask if we can be friends. I understand, Mark, she said. I hope it was all worth it to you, he said. Goodbye, Allison. He hung up the phone and watched her do the same. Tears falling down her cheeks. He went home, packed and headed for Vegas. He met up with Gunny Johnson and the two reminisced over dinner. Afterward, Gunny showed him around and gave him some tips for the gambling tables. Then escorted him to his room, when they walked inside. Mark saw a lovely young brunette sitting on the bed. She got up as they entered, Mark, this is Candy. Gunny Johnson said. She'll be your tour guide while you're here. Gunny, this really isn't necessary, Mark said, nonsense. Son, Gunny said. This is exactly what you need. After what your wife put you through. Relax, have a good time and remember, what happens here? Stays here, usually. They all laughed at that. Well, I gotta go. You kids have fun, he added before he left. Mark turned to Candy, tell me, are you an? He began, escort. Candy asked. Prostitute. Not anymore. Thanks to Gunny. He got me out of a very bad situation, and thanks to him I'm clean. Going to school and working a real job. He told me a little bit about you. And asked if I wouldn't mind spending some time with you. That's all. If you want, I'll leave and never bother you again. No, Mark said. He's right. I could use some companionship right now. And you are a very lovely woman. Would you care to go out for a drink or something? That sounds nice, she said, smiling. They went to the club and had a few drinks. Then talked and danced for a few hours before coming back to his room, where she spent the night. Helping him forget his troubles, he woke up the next morning. To find her giving him a toe-curling blowjob. Afterward, they took a shower together and got dressed. I have classes today. But I can meet you back here tonight if you want, she said. Sounds like a plan, he said. They kissed before she left, and he went downstairs for breakfast. From there, he sauntered over to the casino to try his hand at a few games. He followed Gunny's advice and walked away that afternoon. With about $300 extra in his pocket, he spent it on dinner, drinks, and a show with Candy that night. That night, she rocked his world yet again. The rest of the week went pretty much the same, and by the time Friday rolled around, he was ready to go home and carry on with the rest of his life. Candy hated to see him go, but understood. She gave him her phone number and email address just in case. He ever wanted to contact her again. He liked her, but didn't think it would ever become a full-blown relationship. She was so much younger than him and had her whole life ahead of her. Still, he thought, who knows? He drove back home with a smile on his face, memories of Candy dancing through his head. When he got home, 
he caught up on the news of Allison and her cronies. The judge, after seeing the evidence presented by the prosecuting attorney, ordered them all held without bail. He also received confirmation from Michelle that Allison had been served with divorce papers. According to Michelle, Allison immediately signed them and the papers had been filed with the court. In six months, he would be free of her for good. The following Monday, he went to work and found all his things had been moved into Jake's old office. Everyone welcomed him back and wished him well in his new position. He settled into his new office and found himself meeting the external auditors. He got them situated and was introduced to his new assistant, Marsha Bodini. He had known her ever since she started with the company. A few years earlier, he liked Marsha, knew she was married and had received high marks from her previous supervisors. She also knew his situation and was very careful not to mention it to him. The audit turned up more than a few irregularities in Jake's paperwork. For starters, he had fudged his expense account on several trips he and Allison had taken. Then the auditors found that Jake had mismanaged some of their clients' accounts. This was immediately reported to the SEC, and Jake soon found himself facing federal charges. Mark and David spent a great deal of time in the next few months cleaning up the mess that Jake had left behind. Fortunately, they didn't lose any clients thanks to their rapid response. But they had several very uncomfortable discussions with other executives who were understandably upset. Meanwhile, Mark stayed in touch with Candy, mostly through nails. Eventually, she informed him that she had met someone at school and they were quite serious about each other. He wasn't surprised and wished her well. Dot at the same time, Allison and Jake's trials dragged on as charges were added and motions flew back and forth. Mark found himself testifying against his wife and her co-conspirators, even though her defense team tried to steer him away from doing so, telling him that he wasn't required to testify against his own wife. I may not be required to, but I want to, he told her lawyer. Besides, in a few weeks, she won't be my wife anymore. The jury was shocked when they heard his testimony, and even more shocked when the video Mark took that Friday night was played for them. Finally the day came when the jury would announce their verdicts. Mark and David sat in the courtroom and watched as Allison, Jake, and the other three men were brought in. None of them were able to look Mark in the face. By now, the trial had become something of a media circus. The court was brought to order, and the judge asked if the jury had reached their decision. The foreman stood up and announced they had. Everyone waited with bated breath as the judge ticked off the charges, which included conspiracy to kidnap and rape. Jake faced additional charges involving the drugs found in his townhouse and the lewd photos and videos he had involving underage girls. They were all found guilty of every charge leveled at them. The judge set the date for sentencing, and the five now convicted conspirators were led out of the courtroom. Mark and David walked out, brushing past the gaggle of reporters pushing cameras in their faces, about ten days later. They were sentenced. The judge made it clear he was thoroughly disgusted with all five of them and basically threw the book at them. Jake's three buddies got the lightest sentences, but still faced 20 years in prison. Allison was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison, and Jake ended up with 50 years to life for his crimes. He would also face federal charges brought by the SEC, which would be handled in federal court. Allison sobbed as she was led out of the courtroom. Jake simply looked down in shame as he was taken away. Jake's time in prison ended about six months later, however, when he was found decapitated in the shower. It seems he pissed off the wrong people, who didn't care for his smug attitude. Epilogue, a month after the sentencing, Mark was sitting in his office going over some paperwork when Marsha buzzed him on the intercom. Mr. Hurley, there's a doctor. Kristen Mark is here to see you, she said. The last name caught Mark's attention. Send her in, he said. The door opened and Mark saw an attractive blonde enter his office. Her hair fell below her shoulders and she was dressed in a skirt. 
Nat fell just below her knees. She smiled as she approached him, extending her hand. It's great to finally meet you, Mr. Hurley, she said. He shook her hand and invited her to sit. Please, call me Mark. He said. Would you like something to drink, coffee, tea? Coffee would be wonderful, she said. Black, please. And please call me Kristen. Mark asked Marcia to get them each a cup of coffee. And sat down as his assistant left the office. Marcus, Mark said, looking at her. Are you any relation to Alan? His daughter, perhaps. She smiled and shook her head. No, she said. I'm his niece. I see, Mark said. I'm surprised I haven't met you before. I thought I'd met pretty much everyone in Alan's family. I've been quite busy, she said. I was in France when Uncle Alan died. And wasn't able to make it back for his funeral. So, what can I do for you? He asked. I just wanted to meet the man who took my asshole of a cousin down, she said. I take it there's not much love lost between the two of you, Mark said. She shook her head. No, none, she said quietly. I'm just glad to see. He's finally been forced to pay for his crimes. I'm really very sorry about what he did to you. From what I know about you. You didn't deserve any of it, and I'm sorry. I've heard a lot about you from my uncle. So, I see you're a doctor, Mark said. Are you a medical doctor? No, I have a PhD in business and economics, she said. I teach over at UCLA. My uncle and I shared a lot of the same interests. But I'm more geared towards academics. And no. I'm not interested in moving into the corner office upstairs. Mark laughed at that. They talked for a while longer before she said she had to get back to work. Mark didn't want the conversation to end and, truth be told, he was interested in this woman. Listen, Kristen, Mark said, I'd love to continue this discussion with you, say over dinner. That is, if you don't mind being seen in public with a lowly MBA. She smiled and her eyes sparkled. There's nothing lowly about being an MBA, she said. And I'd love to be seen with you in public. Dinner would be great. How about Red Lobster tonight at 7 o'clock? She handed him a card with her number and address. Red Lobster is, Mark said, taking the card from her. I'll pick you up at 6.30 if that works. I'll see you then, Mark. It's been great meeting you, she said before walking out. That evening, Mark learned from Kristen that Jake tried to rape her after she had just turned 18. Ashamed and afraid she might be blamed. She never said anything to anyone, but avoided Alan and his family as much as she could. She also avoided relationships with men. As a result of Jake's actions and spent months in therapy while going through college, he told her about his experience with Jake. And what happened with Allison? Kristen was shocked, but not surprised. I'm so sorry, she said. You deserve much better. Mark and Kristen dated for several months, falling in love. She nearly tackled him to the floor, smothering him with kisses. When he asked her to marry him, I take it that's a yes. Mark asked when she finally let him breathe. No, she said, that's H-E-L-L-E-S, Marine, now. Carry me to bed and ravish me properly, yes, ma'am, Mark said. Carrying his bride to be upstairs, yes, he thought. Things were looking good. Thank you for listening to this story. If you liked it, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. See you on the next one. Thank you.